we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Who's doing good? Wave at me if you're doing good. Yay! All right, looks like you're all doing good. I love that. I love it. My name is Chris Fluitt, and I want to welcome everybody in person to Redemption Church of Plano, Texas. We're so glad that you're here. Can we hear it for each other? Let's clap for each other. I'm glad you're here. Love to see all these smiling faces. It has been so good to worship with you today. Do you enjoy God's presence today? We loved God together, and I felt God's presence. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. And I want to greet everybody that's meeting us online. However you're finding us online, the internet is a funny place. Literally, I mean, you could be searching for waffle irons and somehow find this video. I mean, it's a thing. Welcome. We're so glad we're Redemption Church in Plano, Texas, and we want, we're, we're very thankful to be able to share Jesus with you. And if you need anything, reach out to us, and we pray God's blessings for you for wherever you are in the world. We're in the final week of our series. It's called what? Problem Solvers. Problem Solvers. All right. I'm glad Marshall knew that because if no one knew it, we would start the entire series over. It's all right. Problem Solver. Last week, we talked about God as a promise keeper. That sometimes your promise, that, that your problem is so big, it's a funeral. That your problem is so big, it is a divorce. That your problem is so big that you can't do anything about it. And in those situations, the only way to solve a problem like that is to have someone that keeps a promise. And we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus are called to be promise keepers. But above all, Christ is a promise keeper. And there is no grave so deep he can't pull somebody out of it. Right. There is nobody that's going through such darkness that his light can't shine it. How many know he is a promise keeper? Yeah. I know it. I know it full well. This is our final week. I want to remind you that we are called. You are called to be a problem solver. That is your problems. You are called to solve the problems in your life. Right? Yeah. You follow me? You are also called to help solve the problems in the lives of others around you. All right. We don't just drive by problems and go, well, too bad for them. No, those are problems that we feel like we are called to solve. When we read the newspaper and we see the problems in our society, we aren't just like, wow, it stinks to be them. No, we are called to solve those problems. When someone comes up to you and you can tell they have a problem, let me tell you, you are supposed to do something about that. Yeah. You're supposed to encourage them. You're supposed to love them. You're supposed to pray for them. In Jesus' name, you're supposed to do all of those things because yeah. our God is a problem solver and he has enlisted us as an army of problem solvers. Smile at me if you think that's true. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I want to ask you a question. It's a bold question. We're just going to go right on this question. Don't answer it out loud, but you get an answer in your brain over this. Here it is. Do you have enough faith to save someone? Do you have enough faith to save someone? Now, when I wrote that question out, I, I got to admit to you that I feel like it's a trick question. Who thinks it's a trick question? It feels a little bit like a tricky question. Like, oh yeah, nice try, Chris. You didn't catch us because we know that we aren't the Savior. We know that we can't save someone from their sin, right? We can't do that. And God, there's only so much healing that's possible with us, right? And I am not, I would love to raise the dead, but I've walked through many cemeteries and I've never called anyone out of the ground, right? So when asked that question, do you have enough faith to save someone? It is somewhat like a trick question, but I want to switch the, the question around, turn it. Sure today that might make you think differently about your answer. It is found in Luke chapter 5. If you got your Bibles, turn with us. If you don't have your Bibles, don't feel guilty. We got 
we got words on screens for you right here. Luke chapter 5 verse 18. Some men were carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this, because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Verse 20 is key. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Look at somebody say, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Look at that. So this story has like three parts really to it. There are some men, right? Some dudes. Everybody say dudes. There we go. And then there's a paralyzed man, right? And then there's a third person. What was his name? Jesus. He's the only one named in this story, and it's a good thing because he's the name that really counts, right? Yeah. Amen. There's Jesus. And if there's the setting is this, that there's a house that Jesus is in, and Jesus is teaching inside this house, and it's so packed that nobody can get in the house. Jesus knows how to throw a house party. It's standing room only, and they brought their friend to bring him to this house to see Jesus, but they couldn't even get through the door. So instead they go up on top of the roof and they lower him through the roof. All right. I, I would have loved to have been, this is one of the stories in the Bible I would have loved to have been at to see. It's on, it's on my top list. Right? That would have been real interesting. And I'm just, just between you and me, I'm kind of curious. D did somebody say, hey, this is my house. They, like, yeah. How many of us that would have been us? Let's get real. They're like, what? who paying for this? Let's just get real a little bit. Like, oh my gosh, you could have asked. We bring Jesus out to you. This is my house here. That's just me, my selfish thoughts on the matter. But I, I want to ask you about the men. Let's talk about the dudes first. What did the men do in this story? Come on, let me hear it. What did they do in this story? They carried their friend on a mat to Jesus, and when things weren't working out, they didn't give up, right? They went even in a direction that nobody had done before, right? Kind of a controversial thing, right? <laughs> Blowing him through their friend. But here's the, the crux of it, just these three words for you. They brought their friend. That's what these men did. They brought their friend. Let me tell you, if you get anything today, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you know what your part in the story is? Bring your friend. Not to church, to Jesus. Right? Oh, let's get real. I would love for them to walk up in here. But what you got to do is bring your friend to Jesus. And that's what the dudes in our story did. All right? Moving on. Let me ask you this. What did the paralyzed man do in this story? He laid there. Kept, kept breathing, right? He did nothing in this story. Who agrees? Yeah. Right? He did nothing in the story. It's hard to know what he did. It doesn't tell us what he did. He just, he, he's just a passenger in this story, right? All right. So we got the dudes. We got the paralyzed man. He has nothing. He, he does nothing. All he does in this story, actually, is he has the problem. He has the problem. And that problem is so bad, he can't get up. That problem is so bad, he can't move. That problem is so bad, he has nothing he can bring to this situation. You got the dudes, you got the paralyzed man, but you got the third person. What did Jesus do? Do And now I want you to think about that for a second. What does Jesus do? Because it's surprising. It says that he turned to someone and noticed their faith. Who's, who, did he, who was that talking about? Look, can we go to verse 20 again? You see verse 20? When Jesus saw the paralyzed man's faith. Is that what that is? No, it is when Jesus saw their faith. I'm... Suggesting to you, verse 20, is that when Jesus saw the faith of the friends who carried that man, 
he sees the dude's faith. And then he looks at the paralyzed man and he says, what? Friend, singular, your sins are forgiven. Do you follow that in this story? Interesting, isn't it? All right. You know who these friends are? They're problem solvers. That's who these people are. They go, my friend has a problem, and this I'm not just going to stand by and let him have a problem. I am going, I have an experience. I have somewhat of a faith. I have something I can do, even if it's just carrying this guy, but I'm going to carry this guy. And they solved the problem that day by bringing their friend. Somebody say problem solver. Problem solver. And Jesus looks at the friends and says to the man, Your sins are forgiven. A salvational moment happens. And guess what? The guy that's laying there doesn't play a whole lot of role in it. Can you? I know somebody in here is already like, oh, red flags theologically. Just calm down for a second. Let me tell you, the point of this story is that somebody's salvation has to do with Jesus and someone bringing them to Jesus. You get it? Stop the, oh, God, let's just get there. Because sometimes in churches, we're so busy arguing about theology, we don't save anybody. Here is Jesus on the cross. Here's, here's his whole width right here. You see him? Huh? You know what religion has done that? We cut him off. We cut him, cut him in half immediately because we have the Catholics and the Protestants. Bam, two parts. And then the Catholics divided. They got Orthodox. We got Eastern Orthodox. We got Russian Orthodox. They got all of this divided. And then with the Protestants, they divided too. Right? Oh, yeah. oh we got, you can name every denomination under the sun, right? Baptists, you know, there's not just Baptists. There's like hundreds of Baptist denominations. There's, there's like 50 Methodist denominations, right? And so they're like splintered. They're just cut up. We've taken this one Jesus who's got the whole world in his hands, we sang in Sunday school, and we've cut him up into all these pieces. And so here's what, we're just going to go there, not in my notes, but we're going to preach to you. Here's the deal. Instead of bringing Jesus Bringing people to the whole Jesus, we're like, oh, which sliver of Jesus are we going to give you? Because we're the little Baptist sliver. We're the little Pentecostal sliver. We're the little Catholic sliver. I'm telling you, Jesus is no sliver. He's all of it. He's the Lord of all. 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 And I'm telling you right now, as Christians, we better get it right. We need to stop bringing people, slivers of people. Just bring people to Jesus. That's all these people did in there. They didn't say, uh 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 Oh, Jesus, we, what, what church, what's the name of your church? We got to make sure it's the name, right denominational name. No, none of that stuff. None of it. They just brought him to Jesus. You want to change the world? We say it every time. You go change the world. You want to change the world? It's letting go of the stuff that divides and get, getting a hold of the thing that saves. Getting a hold of the thing that heals. Getting a hold of the thing that rescues. And the thing is not a thing at all. It's a person. And his name is? Jesus. Somebody clap your hands for Jesus. Woo! Oh my goodness. So Jesus forgave the sins of the man. Save the man in that situation. He actually does this, and then later in the story, if you read it, then he heals the man. And the man does get up, and he carries his bed out of the house, completely healed. Jesus solved the problem, and those friends were a part of it. So I'm going to ask you again, do you here in Plano, Texas, do you here online, do you have enough faith To save someone. The faith of the men. Brought the paralyzed man. To salvation. Mm. Here's how you you have enough faith. And I know you can have a lot of questions about that. You can go down the theological rabbit hole. I suggest you don't. You can go down those worries about. if Do I believe right and all those things. I don't suggest you do that. Here is what I think it comes to. Having enough faith. It's really simple. Believe that you can be a part of the solution. 
it's, that, that's a real simple thing. But I know a lot of Christians, I've met a lot of Christians that have not. They believe that Jesus saves, but doesn't believe Jesus can use them. Somehow they believe Jesus can roll the stone away, but he can't use them. Y'all follow me? That Jesus can't walk on water, but Jesus can't use them. And I would suggest to you, if that is you, you need to go back to the very basics and just like read the gospel of Mark again. You just need to read one of these, the books of the Bible there of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, I suggest Mark. And you might need to just sit down and every time he uses someone, every time he speaks to someone and he tells them to go do it and they sure enough, they go and do it. That's you. I want you to picture yourself in that story. Believe that you can. You cannot be a problem solver if you don't believe that God can use, somebody say it, you. You can contribute. That could be like you just being one of the people that carries the the body of the man. There was more than one person. You can be one of the contributors right there. We live in a consumer world of religion. It's consumerism. If Listen, dirty secret, dirty secret. If you go to any of the, the pastoral uh, build your church conferences, it's all about building a better supermarket of a building. It really is because it's a consumer mindset. Can I tell you, the, the call of Jesus Christ is to not get consumers in the pews, but to get contributors into the kingdom. Contributors, not consumers. You can contribute. You can give advice. You've got life lessons. You've got wisdom. You've got some knowledge that you can give to someone else. And that can solve a problem. You can be a support. Sometimes you don't have to say anything to help solve the problem. You could just be an ear that listens. You could just be a person that holds a hand. You could be the person, all you have to do sometimes is you pick up the phone and you answer it when you didn't want to. And you answer it and you say, yeah, I can meet you right now. That is part of the support. And then you've got to know that you can make a difference. Look at somebody say, you can make a difference. I don't care who you are in this house. You can make a difference. And guess what? Here's the other thing I want to tell you. You probably already are. There, sometimes we think we are not doing anything. I want to tell you, you are doing something. Can I talk to our wonderful team who greets at this church? When you drive up, people are greeting you. When you walk in, people are serving you coffee. Can I tell you, you're making a difference. You're serving someone. You are contributing. Thank you for that. People who are leading a small group. Can I speak to our small group leaders? Maybe you have some small group leaders and like, man, we're just not growing like I want us to. Let me tell you, you're doing a good job with who you're hanging out with. You're doing a good job sharing your story. You're doing a good job listening to the stories of others and caring for those people. Don't give up. You're making a difference. Worship team. Worship team. Can I speak to this worship team? Y'all are making a difference. You really are. Sometimes it feels like, oh, it's so hard growing a church. Yes, it is. It is so hard growing a church. Sometimes it is so hard doing ministry. It is, but you're doing a great work. Somebody clap your hands if you think this worship team's doing a difference, making a difference. And all of this idea of just simply bringing someone to Jesus and and somehow being a problem solver, I want to highlight our mission, our vision here. It absolutely underlines two things in our vision. It serves others. And it is actively going to change the world. Somebody say, serve others. Serve others. Say, go change the world. Go change the world. It does both of those things for us in radical ways. And some of you, you're already doing it. I applaud you. I thank you. Never stop. Never stop. What if you served others in their problems? And what if you changed the world to be that problem solver? Here's how you do it. It's, it's, not, it's not a hard math equation. Here it is. Problems plus faith equal miracles. Problems plus faith equals miracles. It requires two things here. Number one, you have to recognize the problem. And that's where too many of us already mess up. There's problems all around us and we don't recognize the problem because we'd rather talk about the show we watched on Netflix, right? So, like that happens in our conversation. Somebody's like, here is this problem that I have not, I've been scared to share with anyone in the world, but here I am, I'm sharing it with you. And somebody says, that's really cool. Have you seen that show on Netflix? 
Like we do that. Because we don't recognize the problem. We don't recognize the hurt on someone's face. We don't recognize the, the worry that we hear in their voice. We've got to, number one, recognize the problem. You can't fake this. You have to know people. And you have to listen to people. And sometimes you just have to open up and say, just test the waters questions like, how are you doing today? Like, how are you really doing today? Right? I've got a person I'm working on. I want one day want to see Nina in church. I want to one day baptize her. I want to one day. But here's how I met Nina. I met Nina at a Dollar Tree one night. It was a date night. Me and my wife, you know you're getting old when all your date nights end up at a Walmart, a Target, or a Dollar Tree. Pray for us. We end up, I mean, we've had a cute little night. We like went to Velvet Taco. We're holding hands and she's like, oh, we need to stop at Dollar Tree. I'm like, of course we need to stop at Dollar Tree. So we stop at Dollar Tree and there's this woman there and it was the Christmas season and you know, Lord, Lord help all of our service workers. Help every person in the, in the service markets that, that, uh, during Christmas. And there was a long line behind us and this lady, I just felt all of a sudden, she is, she's having some kind of day but she's just barely making it through. And I said, hey, how are you doing today? And she said, do you want the truth? I said, yeah, give me, I want to know how exactly you're doing today. And she like opened up to me right there. She said, my nephew committed suicide by a cop last night and my whole family is devastated and we don't know how we're going to have Christmas. We don't know if we're ever going to have another Christmas and I just don't know what I am going to do. And I said, yeah, and I'll take some Tic Tacs. No. No. Yeah, I, I don't need a receipt, thanks. No, I, listen, I just said, Nina, you've got a whole line of people behind you right now and I don't want to get you in trouble, but I want to tell you right now, I'm so glad you opened up to me and me and my wife, while you check out all these people, we're going to go to our car and before we leave this parking lot, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for your family and we're going to pray for you that in your hurt, you will feel the peace of God that somehow Jesus will show up in the middle of all this heartache for you. What are we doing? We're bringing her to Jesus. We only had like 15 seconds to do this. She's under the clock. Her manager's watching. There's a line that's way too long. And so we went to our car and we did that. I didn't know if I'd ever see Nina again. I walk into that Dollar Tree. And like every time I walk into that Dollar Tree, there is a lady that comes and finds me. And she's like, Chris! She doesn't know I'm a pastor. I actually try to keep that from her. Because it's not about religion. It's not about a church building. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and getting yeah. someone to her. And so she, she comes up to me, she hugs me and she says, You just don't know! When you pray for me, where is Miss Sarah? You tell her that I said, y'all are the best people I've ever met. And I tell her, Nina, Jesus is the best one we've ever met. Amen. Jesus is the one. I'm so glad. Oh, somebody say, Lord, touch Nina. Lord, touch Nina. Lord bring Nina closer to you. Yes, Lord. And Lord, open the door for me to bring Nina closer to to you. There's Nina's all over our world. We won't ever see the miracle if we don't see the problem. Right. Oh, sometimes you're like, I just want to get rid of this problem. So, no, I want to turn the problem into a miracle. Yeah. That's what I want to do. Number one, you got to recognize the problem. Number two is you have to have enough faith to connect the problem to the solution. Yeah. All right. and, and I'm talking not like huge mountain moving faith. I'm not talking you can quote an entire Bible. I'm not talking that you can uh, explain, you know, what communion is, or you can explain the Godhead, or you can explain no, nothing like that. I'm saying you just have enough faith to say, I can connect the dots. I can connect your problem to the problem solver, and the problem solver is Jesus. Jesus. Faith is not absolute certainty of outcome. I want you to know that. Sometimes I get into situations and I just operate by faith and I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know 
It's not about knowing what's going to happen. It's having enough faith to try. It's having enough belief to say, God may have put me in this position just to open my mouth. So I'm going to open my mouth and let's see what happens. Faith is not absolute certainty. Faith is believing you can help. And so you just do a miraculous thing. The thing that looses the miracle is, is you just having enough faith to say, hey, do you want to talk about it? Something that simple. Do you want to talk about it? That you see the problem, you have the faith, you open up your mouth, and when they want to talk about it, then you go to this, do you want to pray about it? And I believe that when we pray for people, that's when the miracle will happen. Yeah. And I believe that God wants that miracle to happen in the middle of Kroger. He wants that to happen in the middle of H-E-B. He wants to happen in the middle of Starbucks. He wants that to happen in the middle of your cubicle at work. He wants the miracle to happen wherever you are, not just in the church. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. So, want to really solve a problem? Be ready to connect the problem to the solution. And that's been this whole series. It's been a little sly. I hope you've understood it. Number one, we had sickness and healing. Remember, sickness is the problem. What's the answer for sickness? It's healing. And sometimes there's different kinds of sickness. There's like an emotional sickness. There's there's a problem there. You need healing for your emotions sometimes. If physical healing, absolutely, right? There is sometimes a spiritual healing that needs to take place. But you know the healer. And so you connect their sickness. You connect their problem to the healer. You connect it, all right? How about people that are stuck? They're stuck in their their debt. They're stuck in their finances. What's the answer for that? You need rescue. They don't see a way out. So you, you take the person that's stuck and you connect them to a Jesus that rescues you out of financial problems, out of bad relationship issues. He, he pulls you out of those things. What are you doing? There's the problem. There's the solution. How about people that have just questions? I don't know what to do. I've got a lot of doubt. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's true anymore. You're going to run into more people that don't know what's true anymore about God. They've seen enough people on TV that turn out to be charlatans and they don't know what to think about God anymore. They 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 they've seen enough people that are that call themselves Christians that are hateful and they don't know what to think about Christianity anymore. They've got questions. What's the answer for questions? It's guidance, it's wisdom. And you find that obviously in the Bible. You find that obviously in Jesus Christ, but you also find that in your daily life. Because you have had your questions answered. Let us always be a church where people can come with their questions. If you got a question, we want to hear it. We're not going to belittle you for your question. I love the faith enough to ask a question. Loneliness is another problem. You know what the answer for loneliness is? It's friendship. It's companionship. And you provide that. But also Jesus provides that. And then there's the loss that people go through. That problem, that is the funeral. That is the, the, the absolute, they lose it all. They could lose their house. They could lose their child. But then you offer them a promise keeper and God is able to answer that, that, that situation as only he can. Do you know that heaven is a restore, restoration of everything you've lost? If you've lost your health, heaven is a place where you gain it all back. If you've lost all your peace in this life, you gain it all back in heaven. Do you understand this? That some of you, you, and if you have a loved one that loves Jesus and you've lost them in this life, what you really need to uh, take a hold of is a promise keeper who brings you into an eternity with those loved ones again. We believe that. We do believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Listen, we talked about that all this series. So if you are questioning about that, you can talk to me. You can go check out this series again. But this is how you become a problem solver. You say, there's the problem. I saw Jesus solve this problem before in the Bible and in my personal life. And then you connect the problem to faith. And then you see the miracle. The men in Luke 5, we don't know their story, but they brought their friend to the ultimate problem solver. They believe Jesus was the solution. Do you believe Jesus is the solution? How has Jesus solved 
your problem. This is really key. I want you to get this. This is really key. How the answer to that question, I just said, how has Jesus solved your problem is everything your friend needs to hear. Okay? So if, if they need healing, you need to pull out your Jesus healed me story. Yeah. Raise your hand in this place if Jesus has ever healed you or someone that you love. Look at that. Okay, so hands down. When somebody says, I'm sick, when someone says, I don't know what to do, you go, oh my gosh, can I talk to you about that? How are you feeling about that? And then you find a way to let them know that you have had a situation like that, but Jesus came through for you. And then you know what you do? You say, can I pray for you right now? And I'm telling you, 90% of people are going to allow you to pray for them right then and there. It's very few people that say, no, I'm just going to keep being sick and miserable. Very few people. No, I've got, I've got a, 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 a Hindu neighbor right next to me. His name is Ali. Somebody say Ali. Ali. God, somebody say, God bless Ali. Uh, Ali has a wife named Fatima and he says Chris stage 4 cancer stage 4 cancer listen I don't know what God's going to (laughs) do I don't know what God's going to do but I know what I'm going to (laughs) do I told him can I tell you that I believe Jesus heals can I tell you that my wife I told her told him my story of how my wife was never able to have babies and now she is too well at having babies she's like too good at it (laughs) baby number four (laughs) thank you lord and i prayed for him right then in there i don't know how he's going to react but i prayed in the name of jesus not as a a come up way but as no i believe that's the problem solver so i'm going to call him by name you know what i just saw ollie yesterday he says chris It's a miracle. She's cancer free. The doctor says it's a miracle. And I said, Ollie, of course it's a miracle. God loves you, Ollie. Jesus loves Fatima. I'm so glad. When are we going to have good Indian food together? He says, Chris, you and Sarah, we're going to go. We're going to do it. That's evangelism. That's discipleship. Not once did I call him a sinner or a no good person. No, he's treasured and beloved by God. And he's got a problem. But I know a problem solver named Jesus. All of these, when you're stuck, where's your rescue story? And if you don't have that story, you need to find someone that does and borrow their story. You got me? Questions. Man, I've got wonderful stories where God has done all of these things in my life. But I want to tell you one time I did it completely wrong. Can I just flub it for you? Here it is. So I'm in college and there's this guy. His name is Go. I don't know where Go is today, but Go was a foreign exchange student. And he walks up to me. We're in the basketball court and it was like a slow day. We couldn't hardly get a game going. And Go uh, walks up and says, hey, you believe in God, right? And I'm like... Yes, I do. Why, matter of fact, I do. And he said, yeah, can we talk about it? I'm like, what is happening? This is like, this never happens. I'm like, absolutely. My place or yours. I've got coffee. I've got drink. You you come right over. So we walked to my house. We're talking to him. Now, here's what I did. I said, he needs to hear about a miracle. So I reached into my bag and I pulled out my best miracle story that I had at the time. And it was like, go I broke my ankle, and while I was on the gurney of the hospital, uh, you know, going through this, everybody's looked at it and says, the question is how many, how, what, what, how bad is the break? You know, and in the middle of that, I prayed to God, and, God, and I'm about to get, you know, it's the crescendo of the story, it's the good part of the story, it's the climax of the story, it's the part of the story where I walk out healed. And go interrupts the best part of the story. And I, in my head, I'm like, dude, you're like ruining this. I'm like a professional testimony giver. Do you, just sit back. Let me tell you how this works. I'm about to get to the part where I'm healed. But go says, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. You mean you believe that God hears you when you talk to him? And I sat there dumbfounded. See, 
we have grown so unaccustomed to listening. To knowing the need of the person in front of us. That we just pull out whatever it is. And we just throw it around. We throw out scriptures. Well, John 3.16, if I quote that loud enough, they'll get saved. If I just wear my Jesus bracelets large enough, they'll know to get saved. We're not listening to them. You got to listen to them. What happened in that story was this. I, I did not listen and I pulled out the wrong story for the wrong situation. Listen to the problem and then give that face, that mode of Jesus, that revelation of Jesus as the answer to their problem. What he needed was friendship. What he was lacking was loneliness. He was in a lonely place and he needed to know that God would listen to him when he talked to him. That's what he needed. We got to listen to the needs around. Are we listening to Plano enough? Tell you need to, you need to listen to the news. Why? Because you need to listen out to the hurts around us. And when you hear those stories about hurt in our life and in our surrounding area, you need to be listening. And you need to say, oh Jesus, I know how you're the answer to that. And you need to be quick to tell that story. And that, is how you disciple people. And that's how you evangelize people and bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through their problems. Nobody comes to church because life's great. I guess I'll go to church. Y'all know it doesn't work that way, right? No, people come to church just like, we are barely making it help. Help, I'm barely keeping above water. I don't know what I'm gonna do. That's why people come to church for the first time. It's what brought them their problem. The problem, the, everybody in our, in our story tonight about the ceiling and going through the scene, everything that brought them to that place was their problem. Yes. It's the problems that bring us to Jesus. Oh, somebody say, thank God for a problem. Thank God, thank God for the problem solver. I want to tell you, as our musicians come, this is an easy way to share your faith. This is a Jesus-centered and a Jesus-honoring way to save, to share your faith. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. And what you're doing in this case is lifting up who Jesus is in front of other people. And most importantly, perhaps, it's the authentic way to share your faith. It's real. It's real of you to open up and say, I have problems too and God has seen me through it. God loved me through my problems. And that's authentic. That is real. I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you have enough faith to save someone? Lord, let us have that faith tonight. We're going to be drawn to a close right here. I've got a call to action for you. I hope that you'll bring this to this altar tonight and pray or pray wherever you are or worship or take it this week. Maybe take out your phone, even take a picture of what's going to be on this screen in just a second. But I want you to take this and say, this is my next step. This is what I'm going to work on this week. This is your call to action. Number one, it's your problem. What's your problem? You need to recognize your problem. If you've got one of these problems that we talked about today, recognize it. Realize that that's the problem. And then what do you do? You bring your problem to Jesus. That's why we come to this altar. We actually ask you to come because you're literally coming with your problem to Jesus Christ. You can't do it if you don't recognize your problem. But come, pray about the problem. And here's the thing. When someone comes, Redemption Church, I charge you with this. Do not let someone come alone. Never let someone come alone. You come with them. You know them, you be up here with them. And you take them by the hand and say, we're going to do this together. Don't ever let someone come alone. Somebody say amen on that. Amen. That's your problem. And then there's your friend's problem. Maybe, maybe while I'm talking, it really hit you in the heart that this is one of your friends. Like you actually thought about their name. You thought you saw their face when I preached this. Then this is your action step. You need to recognize the problem that they've got in their life. 
You need to pray already tonight and activate your faith and just start even imagining yourself having that conversation and say, God, if you'll open up that door. God, if the next time I see them, I promise I'm gonna try to open that door. Lord, please be with me. God, activate my faith in that situation and then be ready to tell your friend your Jesus story. Your Jesus story story. Be ready to tell someone your Jesus story. I'm about about to ask you to come, but I want to underline one more thing on this last point. Your story and his story being Jesus. His story is the gospel. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? But this is not all that is his story. His story is also what he's done in your life. And so, yeah, you can tell somebody about the death, burial, and resurrection. I hope that you'll get to that point. But if their problem is healing, the death, the burial, and resurrection might not be what you lead off with. Consider that. Consider that you you lead off with, well, here's what Jesus did to me. Do we have any examples of that in Scripture? Lots. John chapter uh, 4, the woman at the well, she runs into that city. And she says these words. She says, come meet a man. Come meet a man who told me everything about me. He saw me. He's come meet a man. She she didn't quote a single Bible verse. She told her story. I'm telling you, your story is part of the gospel story. And if you will tell your story, one day you'll also be able to share with them the death, the burial, the resurrection you will in Jesus name these altars are open they're going to sing I want to pray with people I want to see problems solved today I want to see people walk into their calling to share Jesus with others come on let's make that step in Jesus name I'm going to pray for all my friends online right now Father in Jesus name Lord touch all my friends online Lord get a hold of their hearts God Lord work in their life Jesus you are the problem solver Lord I want you to use my friends God I want my friends to confess their problems Lord to you And Jesus, I want you to be the healer. I want you to be the rescuer. I want you, God, to be the friend and to be the promise keeper, Lord, and to be the guide that they need. Lord, do it all. Work in our life, Jesus. Lord, we ask you to flow in this place. Lord, I ask that every heart, Lord, would feel your presence and know, God, that you've got work, wonderful things for them to do in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Let's reach out to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550.